So <clears throat> last week, my, my father spoke on 1 Samuel chapter 3. He did a great job. I listened to most of it online as I was going to a, a tournament that I had committed to many moons ago. It was a basketball tournament. We did really well, if you were wondering. Um, but I want, to, I want to start out really quickly telling you of something that happened to me last year when I was uh, going to school one morning. My son, who goes to Willamette Valley Christian School, it's also where I'm the chaplain and the teacher, uh, we arrive uh, early in the morning, usually before a lot of people are there. And on the outside of these modular buildings are these really massive air-conditioned units. And as we got out of the car and we got on the path and we were walking, I was looking at Rogan and talking to him, and then I was out. I was on the ground, coming up, holding my head, and blood was kind of coming out of my head. And I had knocked myself out on this air conditioning unit, right on the corner, just, I, was, I don't even remember falling. I remember coming up. And the first thing my son says is I'm holding my head and I realize, oh man, I got myself good. He looks at me and he says, are you okay? And I, you know, I just absolutely wrecked my head. And so I look at him and I say, no. And his face, he just, oh, like, he's, he's thinking, now the worst, my dad's dying. And so he starts bawling, and I have to say, I have to look at him like, I'll be okay. I will be okay. But for my son, this was like, I can't, as a father, look at him and say, I'm not okay. Because that means for him, oh my goodness, the worst thing in the world just happened. My, I'm going to lose my dad. That's, that was the face that he had. And uh, I went, I got it nice and, and, and bandaged up. It was a pretty deep cut, but I was, I was okay. And having to communicate to my son in that moment that, yes, I'm hurt, but I'll be okay. But I realized how important our relationship is. That my son doesn't just view me as the person who gives him rules. He loves me, and I love him. And, and the beauty of that relationship uh, is something that, frankly, we're going to see that Israel was, frankly, missing. And that a focus on religion can ruin relationship. And the way in which Israel was focused on religion but missing relationship with God and what that meant. And how God sometimes would cause things to happen to them to get them to see that he doesn't just want them to follow a religion. He wants them to be ever present in a relationship with him. We're going to see that. And uh, an another quick thing uh, to start out with is, uh, I don't know if anyone has friends like this, but when I was growing up, I had a friend, his name was Sean, if you want to know, uh, where whenever we were having theological conversations, and whenever I felt like I was using my logic brain to back him into a corner, he always had an out, his trump card. He would look at me and I would say, look, that doesn't make sense. Look at this, 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 this. Gotcha. He would look at me and say, well, God is amazing. It's like... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to argue that God isn't amazing, but that's not the point. The point is, what you're saying doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. He says, yes, but God is amazing. In other words, I don't ever have to try to make sense because I can just say God is amazing and the problem goes away. <laughs> and, and this idea that uh, we sometimes will use God to try to fit into our plans rather than us trying to fit into his. We want so badly for our way, our understanding to be correct, that we sort of drag God in by the hind legs and say, well, see, 
he's with me. How? Well, he's amazing. And the idea, and what Israel is missing here as well, is that it's not about fitting God into our plans. It's about us fitting into his. And so what we're going to see is a failure in relationship. And, uh, you know, my dad did a, a great job of, of talking about calling last week. And uh, Samuel saying, here, your servant is here, Lord. Your servant is listening. And uh, we need to be better at listening. But we're starting at 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And it says this. Then the Israelites went out to fight the Philistines. They camped at Ebenezer. And the Philistines camped at Aphek. The Philistines arranged their forces to fight Israel. As the battle spread out, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men in the battle line in the field. The Philistines were an a long time enemy of Israel and will remain that way for a long time in the history of Israel. To tell you a little bit about the Philistines is actually we know a lot about them from archaeology. They were uh, an immigrant people from the island of Crete. They had a thing called uh, the Pentopolis because it was five cities, Penta being five. They had these five cities that they, that they came from and that they fought with. And they were more advanced than Israel. They had Greek weapons, so they had nice shields. They had uh, iron weapons. They were among one of the first nations, in fact, to, to refine iron. They were just better equipped than Israel. And so it would be easy to look at this and say, well, they had better equipment. So, of course, Israel lost. Uh, there is also... Uh, an important uh, archaeological site that we found in the 70s, and it's called Isbet Sarta, and it is in Ebenezer, which is where this battle took place. It's in Israel, and in the 11th or 12th century is when they where they found this. So this is an artifact from the 11th or 12th century, and it is just a pottery shard that they found in a grain silo and it at first people thought it was merely what's called an abcdary which is something a piece of pottery that people use to practice the alphabet but one of the lines is certainly the alphabet but then they realized that there is a story on this tablet on this pottery shard and so in this field, uh, in this grain silo, this Iron Age artifact tells the story of how there was a battle, how the Ark was lost, the Ark of the Covenant, which we'll talk about, how a certain uh, person named Hophni uh, said his brother died and how he died. And we realized that this battle of Ebenezer is actually in one of the earliest artifacts that we have found in the 11th and 12th century. So we have proof, archaeological proof, of this war that we're going to see. Because it's a war that this was a battle, but the war is not yet done. They lost 4,000 men. And one of the things that they realized is that they lost not because the Philistines were better, because here's the truth. If God wants you to win, you win. Israel recognized that God was greater, God was better, God was in control, and if God wanted them to have victory, they would have won. So listen. It says this, after they lost 4,000 men, it says in verse, uh, verse 3 of chapter 4, when the army came back to camp, the elders of Israel said, why 
did the Lord let us be defeated today by the Philistines? Let's take with us the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. When it is with us, it will save us from the hand of our enemies. In other words, they understood the problem. Why did the Lord let us be defeated today? There's no way that they lost unless God let them lose. That's great. That is a solid conclusion. But you'll notice that they did not actually answer that question. They recognized that they lost because God let them lose, and they said, why? But then they said, let's bring the ark. We lost because God wasn't present with us. God wasn't with us on this. So let's go ahead and bring the ark. Now, if you don't know, the ark of the covenant was uh, a really important uh, artifact that we see was constructed in Exodus. It was made out of this really nice acacia wood, which uh, my wife told me, that's what our table's made out of. Um, but it's, it's wood that doesn't, uh, is not affected by moisture, really is uh, uh, safe against uh, mold. And so it's just this really nice, solid wood, so solid that it, it, can, it can warp if it's not set correctly. But they, they made this beautiful artifact. It's about four feet, three feet high, two feet wide. This, it's this chest. And on top of this wood chest are two golden angels called cherubim. And so they have two wings. If you ever look into angels in the Bible, uh, if you said, hey, I want to put a, a biblically accurate angel on top of my Christmas tree or something like that, well, you've got to be really careful because there's a lot of angels and some of them are frankly really scary looking. If you read, especially if you read the book of Revelation, we're talking lots of wing, lots of eyeballs. And if you put that on your tree, you're actually scaring people. And so when the Bible, when it's like they saw an angel and they were very afraid, well, you're like, yeah, well, it makes sense. Those things could be really crazy looking, right? Well, in this case, the cherubim have two wings, and they're on top of this ark, and their wings are pointed and facing each other. So they're, they're like this on, e on either side, and their wings are going, and right in that middle is called the mercy seat. And it's the place that represented where God dwelled. So in, uh, the, the idea was, here's the Ark of the Covenant. God dwells in this seat right here. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were three really important things that happened during the Exodus. So the first thing was the second set of the tablets of the uh, Ten Commandments. I say the second set because the first set was broken by Moses because he was so angry when he came down. And he saw that they had this golden idol that he just broke the tablets. And God's like, yeah, you got to start over. He fasted, by the way, for 40 days and 40 nights. Fasted not just from food, but from water. That's a miracle, by the way. Don't ever try fasting 40 days without water because um, you'll die. But he, he did that the first time. And, and then he broke the tablets. God said, you got to do it again. I'd be like, oh, my goodness. Right? So a uh, uh, cumulative 80 days of doing that but he came down with that second set well that was in the ark of the covenant the next was the the staff of aaron the brother of moses and uh in the bible that his staff began to bud and it had almonds on there but his staff represented the line of aaron all of the priests the people who served in the tabernacle, served in the temple, the people who were allowed to go where the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies, those people all came from the line of Aaron, with an exception. We'll talk about that exception here shortly. But that staff was there in the Ark of the Covenant. And then also there was a container of manna, which was the holy food that God had rained down upon the uh, people during the exodus so that they had something to eat so all of these things that represented the provision the law and and the miraculous deeds uh, of god were in this relic 
in this Ark of the Covenant. And they said, well, see, since God sits on that mercy seat, and since this is really an important artifact, and, and God was really intentional about having us make this, really intentional about us putting this in the holiest place, that if we just bring this with us, then God will be with us. He's present with the ark. It's important to him. So God will be present. In other words, they're trying to just sort of drag God in by the hind legs and say, look, we lost because God wasn't with us. So we'll go ahead and make sure that God is with us. And the reality is that here is an example of Israel having a plan and just trying to make God work within it. The question was correct. Why has the Lord let us be to be defeated today? But they didn't actually seek to answer it. Instead, they just said, we lost because God wasn't with us. Here is the way to make sure that God is with us. You know, the challenge for us today is sometimes we make those sorts of plans in our life where we say, this is what I want to do, so how do I make sure that God is a part of that plan? You know, one of the things that my, my father talked about yesterday is sometimes calling is challenging. And sometimes we don't let ourselves be challenged. In fact, the only challenge that we let ourselves have is the challenge of making God work within the plans that we have already established for ourselves. And here, that is exactly what Israel is doing they're trying to make themselves, frankly, the author of the story. They're trying to make themselves the most important figure. When I was growing up, my mom used to tell me some stories. Um, I told you before that she would always tell me, I love you so much, it's disgusting. And she would tell me these stories, and mind you, this is before the internet was really an established thing, so it's not like I could go and verify. And also, I was young, I just trusted everything she was saying. This is not to say that what she said isn't true, it's just I never verified it till much later in life. But she would tell me stories about how kids would get maybe trapped under a car. And she said, but do you know what? Mothers when they would see that their kid was trapped, would be able to summon within themselves a strength that they never would have in their own right, and they could lift that car off that child. That's how strong a mother's love is, right? She was always reminding me of how much she loved me and how powerful a mother's love is. She'd say when, when a mother was put in a situation where her kid was in trouble, she could summon strength that was supernatural and lift a car. You know, when I was thinking about this not that long ago, I said, you know, I never really looked that up. You know, are there a lot of mothers just lifting cars off chil children? And how many children are just getting stuck under cars? You know what I mean? Like, how is that a common thing? Like, Mom, I just got stuck under this car and saved me. So I, I said, I literally, I went to Google and I typed it in. I said, Mothers lifting cars off children. And, uh, and there was a lot of, apparently, by the way, this has been around a long time, people saying this. But here's the thing. It's never been scientifically studied. Why? Because it would require putting people in a situation of fight or flight. And basically, it'd be like, if they were going to do a scientific study, they'd be like, all right, we're going to get these people together and we're going to make them think they're going to die. Okay? And then we're going to put a car and a child under it. No, it's not something that's ethically that they could study. However, the scientific community does recognize that it exists. It's just never been properly studied. They call it, here's the name, now I know what it's called. It's called hysterical strength. It is situations 
where people manifest strength beyond what they normally could do because they are in a situation that is so dire, it's a sort of fight or flight situation. And so one of, one of the stories that I, I saw was of a woman named Lydia Abinayu. And this happened in 2006. And it was in Alaska. And it was a mother who was walking with her two sons. And they recognized that a polar bear was coming. Now, if you don't know this, uh, polar bears uh, are not to be trifled with. So you have brown bears. You can just go like, rah, and brown bears will run away probably. You have grizzly bears. You can play dead, and they might just play with you for a little bit and go away. And then you have polar bears, which you just pray because you're going to die. There's really no escaping. And the mother, knowing this, she looked at her sons and said, run. And then she placed herself between her sons and the polar bear. And then she ran and kicked the polar bear. And the polar bear swiped her and she fell to the ground. And then she just kept kicking. And this polar bear was trying to get this woman, but just kept getting kicked back by this. Now, polar bears are massive and should have no problem at all devouring this woman. But she is kicking. She's like 5'2", get, just kicking this polar bear. And this polar bear can't get it. Someone sees this, fires some shots into the air. But polar bears are the kind of like, that does, I'm not bothered by that. So they actually had to shoot this polar bear and kill this polar bear. But were amazed that this woman could manifest the strength to, to keep this polar bear away. In every story I read, all they talked about was the strength that this woman had. But see, what I couldn't actually get over was the fact that that, to me, wasn't the real strength. The real strength of this mother was in her willingness to stand between the polar bear and her children when she didn't know she had the strength to do anything about it. And that is someone whose strength is in the character of her sacrifice, not in her ability to fend off a polar bear. And see, Israel here is wanting to be strong more than they're wanting to be obedient. And obedience takes a sacrifice and submission of character that can be very difficult. Because it's saying, God, I don't want to pursue my will. I want to pursue yours. I submit to your will. And sometimes that can be, frankly, very challenging. The mother of that story was willing to die for her children. Israel was not willing to sacrifice in order to be obedient. They were trying to force the hand of God in order to be strong. And so by bringing in this Ark of the Covenant, they thought, well, of course we're going to win. Now we have the Ark of the Covenant. God really thinks this is important. God is also present on this mercy seat. We're basically just bringing God into battle. There's no way we can lose. I told you about this hoopla tournament that I was at recently. We won, by the way, our first three games on Saturday. It was really good. Our first game was very difficult. We looked at the people who we were playing against, and they were, frankly, more athletic than we were. I, I play like I'm a 65-year-old man on a YMCA league, okay? I've got my ankle brace on. I play with my back to the basket. Maybe I do a little hook shot, right? That's just how I play. And then these guys are the guys who can dunk the ball. I can touch the net. But we won. We played, we played a better game. Our next game, real tough team, more athletic. We beat them too. Close game. Both the teams that we beat beat the beat the team handily that we were going to play the third time. 
We said, we even asked them, they're like, hey, how was that team that you played against? They're like, oh, well, you beat us, and we beat them big time. It is going to be easy for you. What happens when you go into a situation where you think it's just going to be really easy? Well, you don't give it the sort of attention and all that you should. You know what the hardest game for us was? That third game. Because we went in thinking our victory was already assured. And we got behind. And we realized, oh my goodness, we we need to actually give more effort. Well, here is the situation that Israel put themselves into. They put themselves in a situation where they thought their victory was assured because they had dragged God by the hind legs into the situation. I'll tell you what. If you are not doing the will that God has, if you're not following the way that God has for you, he is perfectly content with letting you fail in that. And sometimes the lessons that God wants to teach you are in the lessons of our failure. And it's hard, but it is what he is going to do. And I think when we have failures in our lives or we have things that happen, we should ask the question that Israel originally asked. Why has the Lord allowed this to happen? Here's the truth. Nothing happens without God allowing it to happen. And asking the question why is one that we should be intentional in our lives. At the very least, it causes us to be introspective. It causes us to look within ourselves and say, is there something here that I'm not seeing? Is there some reason why this might have happened? Is there something I need to be more intentional about in my life? Why is this happening? Is this the plan that God has for me? Rather than saying, I'm going to try to make this work because it's what I want, so I'm going to make God work within this. Well, let's look and see what happened. So the army sent to Shiloh, and they took from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who sits between the cherubim. Now the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, by the way, who were very not good men, uh, they're the ones who are going to take this. Uh, so the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were, were there with the Ark of the Covenant's God. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord arrived at the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the ground shook. They were so excited because they thought, well, now God is with us. And then the Philistines heard the sound of the shout, they said, what is this loud shout in the camp of the Hebrews? Then they realized that the ark of the Lord had arrived at the camp. The Philistines were scared because they thought that gods had come to the camp. They said, woe to us. We've never seen anything like this. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all sorts of plagues in the desert. Be strong and act like men, you Philistines, or else you will wind up serving the Hebrews the way they have served you. Act like men and fight. The Philistines actually recognized that their God, the Hebrew God, was a powerful one. They, they said gods because they don't have an understand, understanding. In fact, on that uh, tablet I told you about that, that pottery shard was mention of the Philistine god, which was Dagon. And uh, they, they had this, this god, but they were polytheistic, so they believed in many gods. They didn't not believe that the Hebrew god was real. In fact, they did. The Hebrew god was real and strong and powerful. And sometimes, you know, as Christians, we do recognize, at least intellectually, that God is strong and powerful. But like the Philistines, our failure is not in our knowledge, but in our willingness to submit. That 
God might have a plan for us, and frankly, we are just unwilling to submit to it because we've got our own plans. And the Philistines are a representation of this. They recognize that God is strong. They recognize that God is powerful, but they do not want to submit to him. So they tell the Philistines, be strong, be like men, or else we're going to end up in service to the Hebrews. So the Philistines fought Israel, and Israel was defeated. They all ran home. The slaughter was very great. Remember, they had lost 4,000 men before. Now they lost 30,000 foot soldiers in battle. The ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were killed. Now, Hophni and Phinehas, their fate was already sealed. We knew it was coming. And their hubris, their overbearing pride in thinking that they could just force God into this fight had failed them. And the misplaced uh, understanding that the Ark of the Covenant was somehow equivalent to God was shattered. The reality was is that they had a misplaced understanding of how God operates. They were really focused on just the religion. That, oh, the Ark of the Covenant, this is what it is. This is how it operates. This is how it works. You'll recognize, if if I told you, that the staff of Aaron was in that Ark of, of the Covenant. And that staff of Aaron represented that the priest would come from the line of Aaron. I told you there was an exception. Well, when God needs to take people out and bring new leaders up to serve his will, he will. And what you'll see here is that Samuel came from a tribe called Levi, which anyone who served in the temple would come from Levi, but all priests came from Aaron, except for Samuel. Samuel was not in the line of Aaron but he was nonetheless called by God to serve as a priest. And he did those priestly sacrifices. You'll see that God brings up Samuel, and when people are not heeding the will and way of God, he will bring up new leaders to serve. And so Samuel was actually an exception to this rule, and he was brought up in this way. And you'll see a little bit about how Eli, the high priest, was probably a little stuck on this idea because for him he's thinking, yes, my sons are bad. Yes, they're not very good. But who else is there? We have the line of Aaron in our favor. So, of course, Hophni and Phinehas are serving. They come from the line of Aaron. I come from the line of Aaron. Even though he's heard from the Lord through these prophets, both Samuel and another prophet before him, that look, you're going to be judged. You're going to lose. The line, your line is going to end. He doesn't necessarily believe it. And he's stuck. He's stuck. He's not recognizing the real power of God that's not on the Ark of the Covenant. That's that's when we, we, we misplace really our trust in things rather than in the relationship of God. That God is a living and active God that will exceed our expectation. You know, when I, I, I've said this before really quickly, but when I was getting into youth ministry, I took a youth ministry class at George Fox. And the youth ministry class was interesting. It was led by a guy named Steve Sherwood, who was uh, a director of Young Life, which is a very popular youth program. And I remember very uh, distinctly sitting the first day in his class. It was a big class. There were about 45 kids in this class. We We were young. We were impressionable. And he started to tell us about when he was a child and how much he loved dogs and how much he wanted to have a dog, but his parents never wanted to have a dog in their house. 
Uh, they just thought, you know, there's, there's too many things that come with dogs, but he would have dog books, dog posters. He would talk about dogs. And they finally saw that, you know, this kid is so fascinated with dogs. He loves dogs so much. We just, I mean, we got to do it. We got to get this kid a dog. So Steve Sherwood was so excited when finally his dad brought home this wiggly, squirrely little puppy, and, and he's like, finally, I get a dog. I've had books. I've had posters. I've researched. I've done so much stuff, and finally, I have a living, breathing dog, and so he's telling this story about how he and his dad, finally, they take this little dog, and they bring him into the kitchen, and they, and they kill this dog, and they, they put it on the, on the countertop, and they start dissecting this dog. And yeah, you're having the reaction that I had, of course, which was, what is, this took a really weird turn. That's a really weird story. And so I'm sitting there at first, I was like, oh, that's nice, they got a dog, and they killed the, they killed the dog. And I'm looking around like, anyone else? other people are hearing this, right? This is weird. And then he stopped, and he said, that's the point that I want to tell you is that when we focus on the religion, we focus on the rules, we focus on these minute details, we do so at the cost of the dog. Like, yes, you can study the internal organs of that dog, but you've got to kill it. And when you do, you miss out on the most important things about that dog. That it lives, that it loves, that it wants to be in relationship with you, it wants to love you. See, Eli, he got so sucked into the the aspects of a priest about the religion that he forgot entirely that God also wants more than anything else a relationship with you. He wants to exist in a relationship with you. And you can see, and you're going to see it. Because when one of the quintessential examples of just The religion of of the Jews, this Ark of the Covenant, when it gets lost, I want you to notice what happens. Eli, by the way, he was old, he was burdened, and he was overweight. He was a big boy. Uh, Maybe because his sons were stealing from the sacrifices and and maybe feeding it to uh, him, but he was very overweight. If you want a good story about that, you can ask my dad after church about uh, a time he talked about Eli. Uh, But Eli is sitting in his chair, he's sitting there, uh, a a big guy, and it says, on that day, this is the day that the Ark of the Covenant was taken, a Benjamite ran from the battle lines and came to Shiloh. His clothes were torn, you would tear your clothes when you were in mourning, and dirt was on his head. When he arrived in Shiloh, Eli was sitting in his chair on the lookout by the side of the road. For he was very worried about the Ark of the Covenant. As the men entered the city to give his report, the whole city cried out. When Eli heard the outcry, he said, what's this commotion? The man quickly came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes looked straight ahead. He was unable to see. Blind overweight and old. The man said to Eli, I am the one who came from the battle lines. Just today, I fled from the battle lines. Eli asked, how did things go, my son? The messenger replied, Israel has fled from the Philistines. The army has suffered a great defeat. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. The ark of God has been captured. This line is the crucial one. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward from his chair beside the gate. He broke his neck and died. The army is lost. Okay. Your sons are dead. That's rough. But when he hears that the ark of the covenant was lost, He falls over, breaks his neck, and he dies. Eli, his focus was on the ritual, was on the religion. He believed that God was present on that 
ark and not recognizing that God is beyond that ark, that God exists in relationship with his people, that the question, why has the Lord allowed us to be defeated, was the most crucial question to ask and to answer. But instead, they try to force, the God into, force God into their own plans. And Eli was a part of that process. He was focused on the wrong things. You know, and what I want us to hear is that we too can get attached to the wrong things. That we can depersonalize the lawgiver and, and focus instead on the rules and the laws, that when I am dealing with students, you know, sometimes they'll come to me and, they, and they'll ask about, hey, what's the rule so that I can tiptoe around on the boundaries? That people want to know what the exact rule or law is so that they can try to make it work with the things that they're already doing. I want to do this, and I want to try to make it work with whatever the, whatever the Christian rules or the laws are. And they're missing entirely what it is to exist in relationship with a God who wants to be present with you and who wants to call you and lead you and who wants to bring you into his plans. He doesn't want to be pigeonholed into your plans he doesn't want you to be like god how do i make you work in the things that i'm already doing i've got a life i got things i'm doing i've got plans i've got stuff that i want to get done and to do how do i make god work within that and we should never be asking ourselves how do we make god work with our plans we should say how do i get into the middle of god's will for my life how do i get into the middle of his plans for me. That's disruptive. It is challenging. And it is, it is confirmed by the people in the church. As my dad talked about last week. That we w should be searching for the will and way of God in our lives. We shouldn't just be trying to get God to work with the things that we're already doing. You know, and I, as, I, as I think about this church, I can tell you this. That we are trying to be very, very faithful about what God wants for this church. Even if it is challenging. Because the right way is always God's way. It's not about it being easy. It's not about it being what we want. It's not about it being what we want to hear. It's not about us trying to get God to work with what we already have. It's about saying, God, where do you want us? Where do you want us to go? Because your servant is listening. And I would challenge you this week to look at maybe some of the ways in which maybe the plans or the, the things you had in your life didn't go the way that you wanted them to. Maybe things are, are falling apart in some areas of your life. And maybe you have plans and those plans aren't going the way that you want them to. Can you ask yourselves the question, why? What might God want me to see or to hear in this situation? If we were just more attentive in seeking the will and way of God, we might see something profound. We might see God at work in our, in our lives in a way that is disruptive, that is challenging, but will ultimately be confirmed. And I hope, I hope that we are people who are attentive to the will and way of God in our lives. And I can tell you that we are intentional as a church. And I'm asking you today, this morning, that you would be attentive and intentional about that in your life. Asking the question, Lord, why? Speak, for your servant is listening. Let me pray. That. Lord, just thank you so much that you are a God who speaks. And often we certainly are not people who are listening. I pray that we would be listening for those disruptive and challenging calls, God. That we would be people who want the will 
and way of you and our lives, that we would not be people who are just pulling you in to the lives that we are living, but we are people who are trying to live lives that glorify you and that are the plan you have for us. God, I thank you that you are a God who has us in your grand design, that we are made by you, God, that we are your craft, that we are your people, that we are your pleasure. And I just pray, God, that we would be intentional in seeking out your calling for us. Lord, I pray for this church and I pray for its people. I pray that we would be people who listen for your call, that we ask the question of our failures. We ask the question of bad plans. We ask the question of things going wrong. We ask why, Lord, and we really seek the answer. We thank you that you are a God who challenges us. You are a God who breaks us when we need to be broken. And I pray that we in that brokenness would listen to you about how to be put back together again. And we love you and thank you for this fellowship and this time with one another. In your precious name, amen. Thank you.